Okay. Okay, guys, good evening again. Welcome to the um, teaching this Wednesday um, for your fellowship examination. Um, tonight, again, uh, we have um, Marwan, who has recently passed his exam. And uh, he has lots of experience um, with the exam. Um, so please try to listen to him carefully. And if you have any questions, dot it down on the chat uh, line or raise your hand symbol next to your name. Also, as always, Shwan is here. He'll be supervising this session and will answer, will help answer all your questions. After this, there will be um, a hot seat viva session. Uh, the theme tonight is uh, foot and ankle. Um, so we'll try to stick to that if we can. Uh, now over to you, Marwan. Go ahead, please. Okay, guys. Um, hi, my name is Marwan Shafi. Um, um, so, and, and I'd like to thank Faras and Shwan for uh, um, uh, asking me to present this. Um, I'm very happy to, to help. Uh, this group has actually provided me with a lot of help in, before my examination. And to be honest, without this group, I wouldn't have passed. Um, and uh, so thank you all. Um, so today we're presenting uh, presenting on, on ankle arthritis. It is a very hot topic, uh, very commonly asked both in viva and clinical scenarios. Um, um, I had um, uh, an ankle arthritis as an intermediate case. Um, so it is very, very quite, it's quite common and actually it's quite easy to score on the, um, uh, on such a subject. Um, so basically ankle arthritis, so it's like any other osteoarthritis. Um, before we do that, we'll just go look at the anatomy of the, of the ankle joint. Um, quick, you probably you guys probably know all that anyway, but just a quick uh, review. You've got bony soft tissue, um, and then you need to know about the motion as well. So, your bony, you know, the tip of the fund, the talus, uh, medial, and lateral malleolus. And the soft tissue is the anterior table fibula, fibula ligament, the posterior, which is the main, um, the calcaneal fibula, and the deltoid. Um, syndesmosis, it's quite important to know the anatomy. I've got asked about that, it's, uh, as you know, it's the anterior and the posterior, inferior tibia fibula ligament, and the interosseous and the uh, uh, transverse tibia, uh, tibial, tibial fibula uh, ligament. These are very important. You need to know um, the anatomy uh, quite well, the ankle joint before starting to talk about the ankle joint. Motion. The primary motion is dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Okay. Um, basically, this is what you need to know. Secondary is eversion, inversion, and rotational. And of course, inversion and eversion also got um, uh, a contribution from the uh, subtalar joint, which is the primary uh, movement of the subtalar joint. Now, any patient comes to you with ankle arthritis, symptoms are very well known. You're going to ask about pain. Um, patient will tell me that he's in a lot of pain. Pain is related to either activity. Um, um, you can ask about uh, walking distances. You can ask about um, what type of ground, what type of brain, aggravated symptoms. Stiffness is a very common problem as well. So decrease in the um, um, ankle movement. Um, uh, due to the uh, arthritis itself. Um, instability can be another issue, and instability can be either um, uh, uh, subjective or objective instability. Patient can tell me, I, I feel that my ankle is unstable. Uh, when you examine the ankle, actually, the ankle is absolutely fine. Um, and instability can be uh, a, a, a presentation of, of a loose body as well. And you need to ask about the ADLs and the deformity. So ADLs are the activity of daily living. So you're going to ask about uh, if it affects the patient's um, job or work, um, and if the patient's a normal or usual sportive uh, per individual. You'll need to ask about that as well. Deformities, um, you know, you can see um, deformities can be either um, fixed or flexible. Um, and we'll talk about that later on during the um, session. Now, most important thing of, um, the, about the arthritis are the causes of arthritis. So primary, which is very less common, it's about 10% uh, 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 you know, incidence and uh, ankle arthritis. Primary is very, I would say it's quite rare to find you know, a normal ankle without any injury, without any problems, just having out of the blue arthritis. Usually there is a cause, hence it's secondary. And the most common cause is post-traumatic. Um, that can be post fractures and um, or um, uh, recurrent ankle stabilities over the over the years. And the case that I got in my exam was a post traumatic causes are secondary, such as inflammatory, such as rheumatoid, uh, or it can be crystalline arthropathy, such as gout. Uh, that's one of the other things that I need to mention. Um, infection, such as septic arthritis, 
um, that can cause ankle arthritis as well. So that's that, all that stuff you know from history. And then the um, other few, the other two causes are the neuropathic joints, uh, such as the charcoal, charcoal joints and the uh, osteochondral defect, sorry, the uh, osteo, uh, osteo, osteoarthritis discus, um, which you can get as well. Now, very important when you get a case of um, whether in the viva or the clinicals is you take a, you know, you need to know about the presentation and the history. It's very important they ask the relevant questions in the history in order to get your diagnosis and in order to, for you to uh, show to the examiner that you know what you're talking about and that you know, you're, you're a good clinician, you're a safe one. So pain, you need to ask whether or not the pain is mechanical or just there all the time. Mechanical as in locking symptoms, if there's a loose body inside that will give you mechanical symptoms. So whether it's related to weight bearing or if it's there all the time. What are the relieving and the aggravating factors? So you're gonna ask about what makes it better, what makes it worse, going up and down stairs, walking for long distances, all that. And do, do painkillers do any, um, um, anything at all to, uh, to control the pain? Um, they'll come presenting with swelling and then swelling. Is that swelling related to activity? Yeah. Or is that there all the time? So if it's there all the time, then you can think about synovitis because it's not, synovitis will not, will not get relieved with rest. It's, it's there, there's a swelling, the synovitis is inflamed and it's big and it's, you know, it's hypertrophied and it's there all the time. So one of the other things that you need to think about I need to ask about walking distances. How long can you walk? Um, and what stops you from walking? Is it pain in the ankle? Is it pain anywhere else? You know, you need to ask about the terrain. So if you've got a smooth ground, or if you've got a ragged terrain, such as you know grass or walking up and down um, uh, uneven um, um, ground, shoe wear. Um, does shoe wear make any difference? And has the patient got any shoe wear modification, such as? Um, bottom shoes and uh, of course the age is a very important thing for history um, because that will guide your treatment as well um, history of trauma is very important um, and previous intervention whether or not this patient had any injections any orthotics any operations such as arthroscopic debridement open debridement etc past medical history um, is um, uh, it's quite important actually so i know that the patient the patient's got diabetes if the patient tells you, yes, I have got diabetes, then you need to make sure that the patient's not gotten your peripheral neuropathy. And that's one thing they have to demonstrate to the examiner that I need to do this uh, monofilament test to make sure the patient has got uh, diabetic neuropathy. Peripheral vascular disease, that's, a, you know, that, that's another issue. And that actually limits um, the surgery that you might do for the patient uh, and if there's any previous infection. Of course, occupation and the BMI, body mass index, are very important things. And they also guide your treatment as well. Now, clinical examination is very important following your uh, history. Um, um, the usual medical school stuff, so look, feel, move, and special test. That's in every clinical examination that you do in your life with the exam. Look, feel, move, special test. The look, so you stand the patient and then you look. You walk the patient and then you look. You sit the patient and then you look. It's look, 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 yeah? So you stand the patient and then you look. So you look from behind the patient, from the side, from the front. You look from the hind foot patient's posture, whether the heel is touching the ground or not, whether the patient's got any arches, scars, or walking aids, okay? And also look at the patient's face, he's grimacing if he's got any pain when he's standing up, which means that he's in pain. And then you walk the patient, and then you look, look for the gait pattern, any abnormality in the gait pattern at all. How is the heel strike? What, what is the initial contact? Is it the heel, is it the forefoot, yeah? And you look at the, uh, whether or not a patient's got any um, type of, um, whether it's an antalgic gait or all that. And then you sit the patient and then you look. You look for scars. You look for callosities of the uh, plantar aspect of the foot. And at that point, you look at shoe wear and splints as well. You need to look between the toes as part of your clinical examination as well. And then after that, you go on to feel. So before you ask or before you do anything, before you touch the patient, you need to ask the patient a very important question. You need to ask the patient, have you got any pain anywhere in your foot, your ankle, and where it is or where is it? Yeah, because if you start touching the patient's ankle and you start screaming, oh, that hurts, you screwed up. And you need to know, you, people, the, the examiner, need, you need to, sh to demonstrate to the examiner that you're safe and you're a person who actually thinks ahead. Oh, yes, I need to make sure the patient's comfortable. Yeah. And then you, you just go on and examine the patient's ankle according to whatever sequence you want to do. I, you know, I, I usually tend to chart, start with the joint line and then walk my, walk my way around. So, you know, you've got medium minor, sad, malleolus, lateral ligament complex. Achilles tendon syndesmosis. And then at the end, you can just mention sensation. In my exam, when I was doing that, she asked me sensation. She asked me what 
uh, what are the um, uh, sensory supply of the foot, the whole thing, the dorsal, uh, medial, the lateral, and the plantar. Um, you need to know that. Um, and then movement. Uh, movement is you have to do two things: active and passive. Yeah. And you just can't do you just can't do massive. No, you have to do active as well. And then after that, you do the passive to see if the patient can actually uh, flex or, ex or extend more. And you have to ask as well if the patient's got any pain while you're doing that. Um, movements can be the tibiotalar joint, the subtalar joint, short bus joints, and whether there, if there's a deformity, whether it's correctable or not. Okay. Now, special tests that you need to know about are the various valgus. So if you've got your, you know, your lateral ligament complex or your deltoid ligament, you need to make sure that they are um, intact because um, that will guide your treatment. Uh, you do the anterior jaw test and also you can do the muscle power. And the muscle power are very easy, just the tip and tip post, at least on the perineum. Okay. Now, investigations that you need to know about. Starting off with imaging, which would be the plain radiograph. Mm. And you need to do that. You need to ask, well, you tell the examiner that you need to be standing views. Okay, which are stress views, uh, and that will show you whether or not the patient's ankle is aligned. Um, and then you look for the signs of uh, osteoarthritis. And I tend to divide them into hypertrophic signs and atrophic signs and angular deformities. So hypertrophic signs, such as ossified formation and uh, sclerosis, and atrophic, such as reduced joint space and cysts. And that actually guides my treatment, because if you've got ossified formation or hypertrophic signs, you can still kind of buy time before going into definitive ankle treatment or, or you know, to treat the, the arthritis itself. Uh, and I'm, I'll talk about that later on during my management. So kind of concentrate on, on, on that, hypertrophic and atrophic and angular deformities. It actually, it, it makes quite a lot of sense when you think about it that way. Um, other investigations that you might need, need to use, you don't have to always ask for them, but if you've got an ankle that doesn't look too bad, you can ask for an MRI scan. because you might have an osteochondral, de uh, sorry, an osteochondritis uh, discans, a defect. Uh, and also you want to look at the degree of chondral loss because that might guide you to whether or not you need to do major surgery or just an arthroscopy. Um, if you're thinking of rheumatoid arthritis, just mention bloods, inflammatory markers, rheumatoid, all that kind of stuff. Okay, now this is a classification called the uh, Takakura classification. I've read about it before my exam. I did not use it in my exam, um, but if you guys like to you know, mention a classification, this is a good one to mention. It's in all the books, it's in all the books, it's, it's well known, it's everywhere. Uh, you know, you need to know the stages, stage one, two, three A and three B. Uh, sorry, I'm going to use it according to clinical practice. Now, going to the management, the important stuff would be an, a non-operative and um, uh, operative. The usual, you always have to mention that. Don't go, don't go rushing into, um, just, sorry, one minute. Well, guys, while uh, Marwan is um, uh, opening the door. Yeah, sorry, guys. Um, yeah, so I was, just saying, I was just saying, Marwan, uh, sorry, uh, if, uh, just a show of hands, please, on next to your name, guys, whoever is interested in the Viva section, uh, Viva practice later on. Carry on, Marwan. Yeah, so management, as I said, you have to always mention um, non operative and operative management. You shouldn't barge into operative, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. That's, that's probably going to fail if you do that. So, non operative management, which works in a lot of the times. Um, you start off with activity modification, um, and weight loss. The patient's got a high BMI. You know, don't hesitate or find it you know awkward to tell the patient you need to lose weight. If the patient needs to lose weight, you got to tell them to lose weight because you're the treating clinician. The next one would be painkillers. So, not to throw the anti-inflammatory drugs such as naproxen, paracetamol, anything to numb the pain to settle the inflammation. That also helps. Splints such as ankle foot orthosis that can also limit the ankle movement and help to settle the symptoms in the acute setting. Shoe modifications such as rock bottom feet, sorry, rock, rock bottom shoes, they do help a lot, uh, such as the one in the picture there. Uh, basically, it limits your ankle movement so patients mobilizing. A lot of patients like to use them and they find them quite helpful. And last but not least, injections. You know, simple things that we do in clinic and um, um, we, we tend to um, uh, you know, do them as a, a, as a quick procedure a quick fix and it does help a lot of times. Now, coming to operative uh, interventions, um, it can be limited surgical procedures. I tend to divide them though. So limited surgical procedures or definitive surgical procedures. That's in the Manaskiewicz book. This is how I studied it and I find it quite, quite, quite well to study it that way. So limited surgical procedures such as ankle arthroscopy. And as I said, when I told you earlier, when you do a plain radiograph and you look at the hypertrophic and atrophic um, uh, signs 
of ankle arthritis, this is what you're looking at. So if you've got a hypertrophic phase of ankle arthritis, could be the early stages, this procedure is quite good for it. Yeah. So you go inside, basically what you do is you do debridement, you do a, 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 a kind of a chylectomy kind of thing to the ankle. You remove all the osteophytes and, um, and that would help um, a lot of the times to uh, relieve the symptoms. Um, just one second. Um, Rock bottom shoes are effective for both um, uh, hind foot, uh, sorry, not hind foot, apologize, ankle, midfoot, and MTPJ uh, potentially as well if you have a solid uh, shoe. The, the aim behind them is uh, to compensate for the uh, rockers of your ankle as you're going through. So if you're not uh, over flexing or over moving them, you're uh, essentially creating a, a pseudo fusion of the joint as you're using the rocker bottom so that you don't have to actually move the joint to move around. So that sh should give you pain relief. That's the end. I think uh, mainly what I know about, I don't know much about rocker bottom shoes, but what I know it's basically, I'm sure you know this, um, Antonio, is to offload the midfoot area up to the metatarsal heads. So if you have any patient with diabetes um, who are at risk of developing ulcers, uh, you want to offload them, or if you have big um, shark cut foot, um, you know, because the midfoot collapses in shark cut foot, so they could be used also to support the midfoot. Um, so based yeah, so as I said, so ankle arthroscopy, when I previously showed you the slide of um, the uh, uh, radiographs basically showing um, uh, hypertrophic and atrophic signs, it's very important that you identify that because, as I said, it does make a massive difference um, to uh, the uh, uh, indications of ankle arthroscopy that are indicated in such, um, in such stages of arthritis. So you've got osteophytes, you've got impingement. Um, um, when you do an ankle arthroscopy, you buy the patient uh, um, a good two years, even if actually more than that, even um, uh, before doing anything major. Um, they get a lot of good pain relief, and um, ninety percent of the time, as I've been there, uh, two years. Um, this is all evidence based. Um, it also helps you to identify any loose bodies or anything that can be a mechanical uh, block, and that, that can be removed as well. And it also helps to identify or to establish. Uh, the degree of chondral loss um, uh, to know exactly what you're dealing with. Um, the very important thing is to actually speak to the patient and consent the patient in an in a, in a organized way and um, convincing way. A lot of these patients, uh, you know, they come back to you or they come to you to have an operation and their expectations are quite high. And you need to tell them that this is just a temporizing man uh, or, or a temporizing uh, procedure. It will just allow him uh, or her some um, degree of pain relief for a few years and then the symptoms will probably come back again. So they need to know that uh, before you um, elect for such a procedure. Um, so, um, and of course, in the exam, when you talk, when you mention ankle arthroscopy, they, uh, examiners might just go down the path of uh, asking about the portals uh, and your general setting um, and what are the um, common problems with the median and the lateral portal. And you need to know that um, inside and out. Now, another procedure that can be done, which is usually not done these days, is an open ankle debridement. Um, very invasive. You know, but you open up the ankle and remove all the osteophytes, uh, but you risk a lot of problems, uh, nerve problems, uh, tendon damage, infection, uh, hypertrophic scar. Um, I, I haven't, I've never seen it done. Uh, what I've seen was just ankle arthroscopy. And uh, you, you can just mention the exam as, as, you know, as part of your limited surgical approach, but you, you know, say, don't emphasize and don't go in deep into that. Um, another thing that you just mentioned as well, and just to show that you, you know, you've got an idea about is the joint is stretching mm. using a little bit. Um, uh, I haven't seen it as well, um, but you know, in the literature has, uh, has showed that it, it does give some um, um, improved um, pain tolerance um, and also uh, some range of movement. If you look at the slide here, it takes, uh, takes about three months and then uh, at six weeks you start putting a hinge on and start moving the ankle. Uh, but you got, it's got indications that usually, um, it's usually um, done in patients who are young, such as 45 years old patients, uh, moderate to severe arthritis. 
Um, uh, and as I said, you need to tell the patient that it's not a long lasting fix, it will, it will come back again. Um, and you need to tell them about the complications such as pin site infection. Now, real arm procedures such as the supramalleolar ostotomy, that's also mentioned. There are a few papers that have shown some good results. I haven't seen that done either, but it's mentioned in the mm. books, and I think it's one thing they also need to mention. Um, it's same thing as high tibial ostotomy, so you need to have fairly minimal arthritis in the ankle joint, um, and also some minimal tailor tilt. There are some degrees that, you know, such as doing a high tibial ostotomy, the same thing as an ankle. Um, there are do's and don'ts or when to do it, um, what degrees of bearers or bulbous you can apply it to. Um, and of course, you need to have a fairly, very good and near normal ankle range of movement. Going to the definitive surgical procedures, and these are basically that's that's where all the money is. So in the exam, you're going to start talking about when you when you reach that level, you need to know this very well. Um, I've started off with arthrodesis because it's the gold standard. Some books start off with uh, ankle replacement, but I think arthrodesis is a preferred option um, with a lot of people. Um, so it is the gold standard of um, ankle arthritis or end-stage ankle arthritis. Uh, fusion rates are between 80 and 90 percent, um, and um, and that's about between meta-analysis have shown that in different papers that the fusion rates can, can even get more than 90 percent as well. Uh, got a very good um, um, uh, pain or relieving relieves pain quite well. Uh, excellent actually. A lot of people come in after it's fused and they have no pain whatsoever, and they're very happy to have that procedure done. Um, there are some problems. So, for example, if you're walking on uneven ground, um, that sometimes makes it difficult. Um, and that can even lead to further future uh, subtalar arthritis as well. Um, um, and, and one of the side effects is, is the gait analysis in the labs has actually shown that um, uh, walking speed actually decreases after arthritis. But a lot of patients do not actually um, um, uh, kind of um, figure out or can't even see, can't, can't sense they've actually got this. They, they, their most important thing is the pain. And once the pain is sorted, they're very happy. They don't care about whether the water is in. So you have to mention it. Um, so every operation, every major operation has indications, contraindications. Mm -hmm. So indications of ankle arthrodesis usually reserved for younger active patients. Um, failed ankle replacement, significant ankle uh, bone loss. So in the exam, you get your patient who's 45 or 50 years old, uh, who's a truck driver or whatever, and he's fitting well, or in the virus even. Um, uh, if you start talking about total ankle replacement, you're probably not going the right route because it won't work. Uh, usually uh, these patients tend to do very well with, uh, with arthrodesis of the ankle. Uh, they are high demand patients and um, they'll probably wear out their ankle replacements quite significantly, quite quicker than, than uh, others. Um, contraindications to ankle arthrodesis, um, first of all, will be um, active infection. So if you've got infection inside the joint, you can't do it, it won't work. Uh, same thing for a lot of other procedures as well. If you've got profound vascular disease, so if you open up the ankle with profound vascular disease and start fusing the ankle, it will not unite. It might even end up with gangrene amputation. So you need to make sure um, uh, that uh, patient has got profound vascular disease. I'll talk about profound. You, you can do it in patients with vascular disease but you need to uh, refer to vascular surgeons and ask for their advice as well. Uh, and of course, if there's severe uh, tibial malalignment, and at that stage, it's not the ankle that will fix it for you. You need to pick up things that are higher above, uh, such as tibial osteotomies to align you your, your lower leg first before doing anything for the ankle. So types of ankle fusion, you can talk about loads of things um, and you know, can pick and choose uh, what you've seen. Um, uh, in the exam, I talked about open ankle fusion. Uh, I have seen ankle arth arthroscopic assisted ankle fusion before, but I, I've seen open ones uh, more often, so I spoke, to that, spoke about that. Um, I can use a rigid internal fixation for ankle, for ankle um, fusion, such as cross uh, screws or parallel screw compression or an anterior tension uh, plate. Um, for arthroscopically assisted ones, it's very easy, it's good to do, but it's high technically demanding. And if you haven't got a good joint space to enter, then you probably won't be able to do it and you'll end up doing an open ankle um, uh, fusion. So you basically looking at, if, if, you get, if you get in the exam a, a, an x-ray with a completely obliterated ankle joint with, you know, um, can't even see the joint, and then you say, I'm going to do an arthroscopic ankle um, fusion, you need to be prepared to, you know, to kind of, 
uh, I wouldn't say fight, but I need to be prepared to uh, look at another option such as the open one because it probably won't work because you haven't got any joint space um, uh, to, to, to use your uh, scope. Um, other other reasons, other other types of ankle fusion can be the Lizarov techniques um, that can be used as well, but it comes with a price, so pin track perfection. And of course, you can do a hind foot nail, which is typically a pin fusion. Um, that's usually uh, that's usually used in uh, childcare joints uh, more often than, than uh, any other problem. <clears throat> now, it's very important that you get to know that position infusion. It's very simple. Just learn it that way. So five to five degrees of others, five degrees of external rotation, neutral dorsal flexion, and slight translation. In the book, it says you might even do more dorsal flexion, but they say you only do that in the cases of C if they've got problems with their knee uh, uh, to assist them in their walking. But this is what you need to know. So five degrees of others, five degrees of external rotation, neutral dorsal flexion, and slight posterior translation of the talus. Okay? Now, complications of um, uh, ankle arthrodesis, very important to know, and of course that's in your history as well, you need to know the patient's social history, so you need to know if the patient's a smoker. So if the patient's a smoker, you need to tell them that, you've got a very high chance of that uh, ending up with a non-union, because it won't unite, especially with the ankles. Uh, so a lot of axial surgeons I've worked with, they do not do ankle fusion in patients who are smokers. They, they say, no, we're not going to do the operation. You need to stop smoking first and then come back and then we can do the operation. Uh, malunion can be another issue. So if you've got, you know, if your fixation is not adequate, that can end up with a malunion. Or basically, if it's adequate but you've positioned it in a wrong way, then it, it can end up with a malunion. And the usual stuff, which is infection, pool wound healing, uh, pin track infection, if you're using a painful neuroma, and posterior nerve, tibial nerve injury, and vascular injury as well. All the, all the normal, all the, I would say, all the, all the, all the well-known complications post, post surgical, post, post surgical. <laughs> Um, last but not least would be the total ankle replacement, and you know that's another um, uh, uh, type of treatment or definitive surgery that you will be asked about in the exam. I got asked. I went down to total ankle replacement. And talked about this. So you need to know the indications of the contraindications. Some books write the contraindications as relative and absolute. You can. Uh, I kind of just put the absolute ones. You can use a relative as much as you like. Uh, I tend not to mention relative in the exam because it's relative. So if I mention to this relative, he can he might find it that it's not relative. It's not, I can I still do it with these patients. So I tend to do I, I tend to learn the absolute contraindications and, and and talk about them. So your indications, no physical demand patient. So if patient above 65, 70, doesn't do much, you know, he's not a laborer or whatever, you can you can do an ankle replacement. Um, age more than 55, more than 60. Uh, coronal myalignment less than 10 degrees of varus and valgus um, and you need to make sure that the ligaments the lateral and the medial are competent because if they're not your ankle will fail that replacement will definitely fail and I've written here reconstructable because you can actually some surgeons uh, tend to reconstruct if you've got a deltoid ligament uh, rupture for example or a deltoid ligament insufficiency some actually some surgeons reconstruct the deltoid ligament and do the ankle replacement. Uh, so it's that you can count that as well, it can be a relative one as well. Um, and of course, degeneration secondary to inflammatory, osteoarthritis, or post traumatic arthritis. These are very difficult to, um, uh, to, uh, to, for these patients, very difficult to do an ankle replacement for them because their anatomy is completely destroyed. destroyed. The, uh, the soft tissues are, uh, are not balanced and they're incompetent. So doing an arthritis is a better option. Contraindications, so high physical demand patients, so watch what, what I was saying about earlier. We tend to use arthrodes for these patients. Uh, peripheral vascular disease, so uh, the same thing, so profound peripheral vascular disease. Uh, peripheral neuropathy, including charcoal joint, you should not be doing that. Uh, any neuromuscular disease that can cause paralysis. Coronal myeline more than 20 degrees. Uh, and soft tissue compromise. So the things that, when, when I got in my exam, I got an x-ray with, with this, this x-ray on. So you can see there the, the, the star uh, total ankle replacement, which is very commonly used in the UK. And the examiner asked me, you know, this implant, and I said, yes, this is a star ankle replacement. I knew because it's just common. If, you know, I've seen it before. I've, uh, I've, I've worked with a financial surgeon who does stars. So uh, you need to know an implant um, uh, to talk about. So. You know, um, design features, so you need to know that a successful executed um, total anchor patient provides a patient with a near normal uh, pattern of, um, uh, of movement and 
kinematics of the ankle, knee, uh, and the metatarsal joints. Um, in three dimensional design, both tailor and tibial elements are metal. So they are metal um, with a plastic uh, in between. It can be a, a mobile or a fixed bearing. Uh, the star is actually a mobile bearing, so um, uh, which, which, which you need to know. Um, and the mobile bearing implants with the highly congruent bearing surfaces overcome the problem of high contact stresses uh, and open polymer. That's why the star has uh, better uh, results than uh, others. Um, at the same time, they're not constrained as the first generation, where we introduced the shear of uh, the bone implant interface and, of course, reduced the, the loosening. I, I know this is probably quite dry, but just read it because, you know, if you understand the philosophy about the star or uh, the, uh, the evolution of ankle replacements, you're probably able to talk about it in the exam. Uh, uh, complications, you can put a long list of complications, but I tend to do, to do it that way, like the Banaskevich book, um, and I find it very nicely uh, written there. Um, a recent meta-analysis identified a few complications following ankle replacement and their likelihood of causing failure. So they basically they put the complications down as either low or high grade, and, and, and what actually they can actually at that point look at whether this implant is going to fail in the future or not. So if you've got a low grade, so they've got the low grade complications, which are very likely, very unlikely to cause failure, versus intraoperative fracture and wound healing problems. Medium uh, grade, such as the um, failure occurs less than fifty percent of the time. Uh, such as the technical error, error uh, the, the way you put your implants in, uh, external internal rotation, uh, various or valgus, um, subsidence and uh, post-operative fracture. And of course, a high grade, very well known for the three, which would be the deep infection, aseptic reducing and implant failure. The most common cause or the most common reason the implants uh, or the total ankle fails is aseptic loosening or subsidence. This is how they fail. This is the most common reason why they fail. Okay, um, so you just need to mention that in that way. Uh, I think it's a, it's a that's how I've, I've mentioned it in the exam, and I, I think I find it quite quite useful. Um, and of course, evidence at the end. If you reach that level of evidence, not much trial is going on, but at the moment there is one being run at the moment in the UK called the Tarva trial, which is the total ankle replacement versus arthrodesis. releases. I have mentioned in the exam, and I've told the examiner that there is a trial at the moment called the Tarva trial. And it just, you know, basically it, it compares these two procedures together. I think, I'm not sure if that would be, uh, I mean, Schwan and, and, um, and Farad, I'm not sure if that would be counted as evidence, but I have mentioned it in the exam. And I've also mentioned what's underneath, which is the NGR latest report, which is 8% failure rate after eight years. I think these were the only two mentioned, basically, well, the ones that I've studied before the exam and I've went in and started talking about them. So I'm not sure if that would be counted as, as evidence. Um, it might be, I'm not sure. Um, it, it, NGR will count as evidence. It does. It does. NGR definitely counts as evidence, but uh, uh, prospective randomized control trial that you know is ongoing and you're waiting for the results uh, means you you understand the literature and you. Yeah. you know, yeah. So it's reasonable to say something like that. Yeah. So if you mention them, they're, they're very easy. What you know. you're saying, but you, you, you're waiting for the results is what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Uh, at least you're showing the examiner that you know you're aware of a trial at the yeah. moment. And, you know, you, you know, I think. I think it depends on where you mention it in your answer. I think you, you said the right thing, Marwan, because it's towards the end of your answer, after you covered all the basics and went yes. covered all the options and everything. And then you put the sort of cherry on the top of the cake by saying, I am aware of this trial that's comparing. Um, we don't know the results yet, but you know, mm -hmm. something that's coming. And, and you, you know, that may be something the examiner himself didn't know about. And, and that will impress, I think, provided obviously the all the basics be covered yeah so yeah so i think these two if you mention these two in the exam when, when you reach that level then i think you're fine yeah um and i think that's it so my advice for the exam is to keep things simple really 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 simple uh, be organized in your answers appear confident you probably won't be confident like myself i was dying from inside you know uh, but you have to show yourself you know you have to try as much as possible to suppress that feeling and show that you're actually confident that you know what you're talking about. Well, you have to know what you're talking about. Uh, of course, higher order thinking and actually believe in yourself. You have to really know that you've done a very good job of work. Um, and by that, you probably answer uh, you probably answer all the questions. Just listen to the examiner and take it easy. And thank you very much. I'm sorry, 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 sorry for Marwan. He is in his own days in Egypt and uh, very kindly donating his time to us.
from uh, from holiday in Egypt. Thank you, Mulan. Thank you very much. It's very good. This is a five star presentation, actually, despite all the distractions you had. But it's honestly top presentation. It has all you need to know about ankle arthritis. Marwan kindly covered the history, and he he in in his one slide is possibly you could you could get the his, all the history points from the um, examination. What you're asking about pain, asking about stability, asking about deformity, um, about activities of day, daily living. If they just want to listen to the headlines. Um, it's a simple but very important topic. And uh, I, I particularly actually like, uh, Marwan, just the way you approach the radiographs, hypertrophic and atrophic and angular deformity. I have to use a system to use. Yeah, system to have everything. And I, I think that's a good, very good system. And, uh, and again, I think, um, you know, common things are common. Uh, you, you covered all the treatment options. You, you got to go to the examiner through those all these treatment options, but don't um, stick too long on the less important ones. The examiner wants to get into the ankle arthrodesis, really. They want to know how you're going to do that. You know, so, but mention to them, and I just would add... Maybe That's literally it. I would probably, I would list your options uh, in none of this is operative, and then go through them quickly without actually... You know, uh, going into detail with them to make sure you, your examiner realizes you understand what you have in your arsenal of, uh, um, as Marwan said, keep it simple. And that was really very good presentation. I have no. Prepare the question to start with.